Hello, my name is Podrick and I'd like to welcome you to our first live interview in this series of gaining an insight behind a particular subject with someone who works in that specialised field. Today I'm joined by Ben and Kirsty from an animal rights campaign group. I'm sure you all know Peter. I have an earpiece in my ear feeding from upstairs, so if any of you guys have any questions you want to ask Ben or Kirsty today, you can do so by commenting on the video feed, tweeting us at Truthloader, or by leaving us a post on our Facebook Truth Letter page. Thanks for coming along, guys. Um, for those of you who don't know, could you tell us what PETA stands for and what the main aims and beliefs or, of the organization are today? Sure. Well, uh, PETA stands for People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. Um, it was founded in America in the 80s. It's pronounced PETA as opposed to PETA, which is one of the most common questions I get. Um, our fundamental belief is that animals are not ours to eat, to wear, to experiment on, to use for entertainment or abuse in any other way. And that's been our guiding principle for over 30 years. In the UK, we're relatively new. We've only been around for 20 years, but we've grown into one of the largest animal rights organizations in the country. We have a very active uh, youth movement um, through social media. We're the biggest group on social media, on Facebook and on Twitter. Um, and that's steered a lot of our campaigns. We now uh, drive a lot of our traffic through the website, um, emails, targeting activists, getting very involved um, through their campaigns online. And um, yeah, things are exciting. There's been a real uh, change recently in terms of people's views of attitudes towards animals. So how big a community is it are we talking here? Uh, well, we've got hundreds of thousands of members. Uh, in the US, our affiliates got over 3 million members and supporters worldwide, which makes them the largest animal rights organization in the world. Um, but in the UK, we're relatively fledging, but you know, we've had a lot of success for animals over the years. Uh, and how do you think you're seen by people in, in, in the world? I know myself growing up, uh, without not knowing a lot about pizza, I would have, you know, people say, well, oh, you're the ones who throw paint at people who are wearing fur and stuff like that. Is, is that realistic? That, that hasn't happened in a long time. In the UK, we're a, a charity, and we'd simply lose our charitable status if we did anything silly like that. Mm. We're now using much, much more effective at using online marketing tools. Um, you know, the, the days of, of grassroots activism are over. It's now you're able to do far much more online and uh, with you know, much more efficient use of efforts. What, what about funding? Funding, um, we, you know, we get funding like uh, the RSPCA and other animal charities uh, just by people being kind enough to donate a portion of their uh, the monthly salary uh, in wills. And, um, you know, we are we're a purely a funded organization. We don't, um, we don't have any government sponsorship, for example, and that drives our work. And we're incredibly grateful for our fundraisers and our, and our charitable givers alike. Okay, so today we have two or three subjects we're going to touch on. I believe, I'm not sure who has a specialized field in what. One of you uh, has dog and bullfighting, am I right? Okay, then we're going to take it with you, Kirsty. I'm going to start with that. Um, are there different levels to this dog and bullfighting? Well, I'll start with bullfighting first. Yeah. There aren't really different levels to bullfighting. The important thing to, to realize is that in every bullfight, every single bull that is forced to take part and is tortured, is brutally slaughtered at the end of every single bullfight. In Spain, um, the bulls are, are slaughtered in front of the crowd. So we want you to imagine what it must feel like for the bull to be forced into an arena, to have swords plunged into his back and his neck and his body again and again until blood is literally pouring from his wings. He's absolutely terrified. He's in excruciating pain. He doesn't want to die, but he can't run away, and soon he can't even stand up. Once he's fallen to the floor from sheer exhaustion and massive blood loss, he can only watch and wait as a knife rips through his spinal cord with the aim of killing him. And that is the experience of thousands of bulls every year in Spain. In Portugal, the same level of violence is inflicted on the bull in every bullfight, but they don't kill the bull in front of the crowd. Instead, they drag the bull from the ring and leave him bleeding to be slaughtered hours, sometimes days later. With dog fighting, you could loosely put it into three different categories, but the important thing to, to know is that no matter what category you choose to put it in, all dog fighting is incredibly cruel, violent and illegal. So you've got street fights, they're people generally unorganized, people who meet on the street corner somewhere, sometimes associated gangs. You've then got people who do dog fighting, see it as a hobby. Yeah. Incredible, I know, but um, these are more 
organize, generally plan fights in, a, in advance, and they train their dogs to be as violent and as aggressive as possible. You've then finally got professional dog fighters who often have a lot of animals all at once, sometimes more than 50 that you've got, and they're training them. And these people make money from selling, from breeding, from selling, and from fighting dogs. So there's a black market then, essentially? Absolutely. It's all underground because it is illegal in this country. Uh, how much money are we talking here, roughly? Well, um, I'm, I'm guessing huge numbers there. I mean, mm. it's all underground illegal gambling, so it would be very hard to put a finger on the exact sum. But when these places are raided, it's often found with other things such as guns, drugs, and yeah, illegal gambling, as I mentioned. Um, it, I'm not sure, what, is there a penalty, you know, how, how does Peter step in with, in terms of the law? Are, mm -hmm. are, are you contacted afterwards, or do you, do you ever get approached, tip-offs, that kind of type of thing, does that happen? Yeah, there's a lot of cruelty cases around there, and we see incidents of dogs who have been mutilated or have been abused in many ways. Peter, sometimes, when we're able to, we do step in and offer rewards to find people and to bring them to justice and um, that's something we do quite often and you've also got of course the RSPCA who are working to shut down these rings and often do raids on properties and find these illegal dog fighting rings and try and shut them down. Okay, um, the only thing that's just saying to me here is that should we just have to speak a little louder because this is a massive room, I don't sure. know if, everyone can say, if that's okay with you. So who is involved in organising these type of activities that I know you, and is it, you know, especially in the UK, I think that's where, where your interests lie. Mm -hmm. Well, with dog fighting, it, it, you can only say that it is cowards that pit one dog against another for entertainment or for profit. And the only way to stop that from happening is by uh, introducing anti-breeding uh, legislation and through sterilization efforts. So we're talking spaying and neutering dogs instead of breeding them to be used for entertainment and then thrown away when they're no longer worthwhile. And one other point as well, undercover investigations have shown that children are often um, taking, not taking part, but they're often involved mm -hmm. watching as spectators these dog fights. And that can often lead to um, insensitivity towards animals and enthusiasm for violence. Just going back to bullfighting, the UN this year declared bullfighting to be against the Treaty on the Rights of the Child. That is the most ratified treaty in the history of the world. And they declared bullfighting to be against the human rights of the child because of the extreme violence involved. And the same can be said for dogfighting. With bullfighting, of course, it doesn't take part in the UK. It has been banned in this country. But uh, again, you've got, in every bullfight, you have men who come in on horses. We're talking multiple people who stab the bull with their swords. Then more men come in on foot and stab him with banderillas, their harpoon-like point at the end. He loses a lot of blood, he's completely exhausted. And finally, when he's about to die, the matador is called in, and it's his job to attempt to kill the animal, although he's already lying on the floor. If he fails to, and only further mutilates the animal, then another person comes in, the executioner, and attempts to finish the job. So it's a lot of people on one animal, and then people involved. You mentioned extreme violence and the UN there. Is, in terms of popular culture, movies and TV programs, we see this type of bullfighting going on in Spain. Is, have, I'm not sure if you approached the movie directors or producers. Is that something that has been done, or do they just continue to ignore this? Well, you, you've got movies and people who do that, but there, you've also got a lot of people who are against bullfighting. The opposition to bullfighting in Spain, as well as in every other country, is already vast and is mounting all the time. There was a recent poll that showed that 76 of Spaniards are not even interested in bullfighting. Whether movies choose to take that on board or not, the truth is they're against bullfighting. And the numbers go up even higher for younger people, the younger generation, so the people we've got coming forward now. They're not interested in bullfighting, they actively take part in demonstrations and campaigns against it. And the important point to note is that bullfighting in Spain, in all other countries, could not continue without the subsidies they receive from the EU. So taxpayers like you and I are effectively funding bullfighting in Spain because they receive EU subsidies and tourism, of course. Most of the people who go to witness a bullfight 
are tourists who have no idea about the level of violence they are about to watch. Most of them come away completely shocked, completely disgusted and saddened by how long they've watched this animal be stabbed to death and to die and must ne vow never to return. And we would, of course, say just simply never attend a bullfight. Don't give your money to this industry that is dying anyway. It's tourists that are propping it up. Take your money elsewhere and spend it on other things to do in Spain. Okay. And in terms of, you know, what, what's this, in terms of bullfighting, what's the solution? Um, how, I know it's like, how long is a piece of string? There mm -hmm. was gladiators 2,000 years ago, and that, you know, that doesn't happen anymore. Mm -hmm. How, how quickly do you think we, there can be a turnaround to prevent this from happening? Bullfighting is on its last legs. It is a dying industry. The support for it is d declining dramatically. If you look at any bullfight, they can't sell the tickets. No one wants to attend these things anymore. And as I just mentioned, the only reason that it's still happening is because of the subsidies they receive and the tourists. So don't attend a bullfight as a tourist, for one, um, and then no one will be going to them anymore. And also, we will continue to fight these subsidies that they receive, both from the Spanish government and also from the EU. Um, you can do so by visiting our website, peter.org.uk. We've got an action on there that people can do to write to the EU and demand that they stop these subsidies now. In terms of how quickly, um, it, is, it is very hard to say, as you said, but um, within my lifetime, I would hope. OK, then. And going back to dog fighting, um, what types of dogs are used and why are these dogs used in particular? Mm -hmm. Well, if you visit any animal shelter like Battersea Dogs and Cats Home, you will see wall-to-wall -wall pit bulls, pit bull type dogs and Staffordshire Terriers. These are generally the, do the dogs that are used for dog fighting because their breeds are strong, they're easy to get hold of, and yeah, they then train them to be even more aggressive and violent for the dog fights. Um, the only way to stop this suffering and misery is to make sure that these animals are not bred for the sole purpose of being abused for entertainment and then thrown away when they're no longer worthwhile. And that again is through spaying and neutering animals instead of breeding them. When If you want to have a dog, go and get one from the rescue centre. Don't, don't pay for a breeder who has probably bred lots of dogs for this for money instead yet. Yeah rescue a dog and that, that's the only way to stop this cruelty from happening. And if you were to get a tip off um, from the RSPCA, um, mm -hmm. do you work closely with them or yeah, how does that work? Mm -hmm. Well we do work closely with the RSPCA but they're the people generally on the ground. They have the power to go and actually go into these people's houses or ask to go in there and see these animals. We do sometimes get tip offs if possible. We contact our local activists and ask them to go and check on these dogs. There was a dog, for example, a Staffordshire Bull Terrier it was last week. We received a tip off that he was living in squalid conditions in Bolton in Manchester. And we got in touch with our activists in the area. Three of them kindly stepped forward to go around and check on the dog. Luckily, we found after the owners had received a letter from Peter and from the RSPCA that they'd cleaned up the dog's area and he was now living more comfortably. So we do what we can, and if we can work with the SPCA, we will. And is there a percentage of dogs who may be involved in bullfighting and they get taken away from their owners who, what happens to them? Do, they, do the dogs get destroyed or are they rehomed or is that, is that possible? Well, often these dogs that are trained for dog fighting have been, they've not led a normal life. They're completely desensitized to human affection. They've been made as aggressive as possible. Sometimes, after being kept in cages and on chains their entire lives, they just go insane. I mean, that is not a life to live. Unfortunately, most of these animals, many of them, cannot be rehomed simply because, one, there are not enough homes to begin with, but two, because yeah, they are an aggressive animal and putting them with humans is no longer safe. Sadly, lots of them do have to be asleep. Sometimes this is the best, the only way you can help these animals and put them out of their suffering. If they can be rehomed, that's great. And yet we support rehoming and adopting when possible. So if there was a fight on the street today, what would happen to the losing dog and the winning dog mm -hmm. afterwards? Are they glorified? Is, you know, does one dog get savagely beaten and brutally attacked? What, what happens? Is the dog left there? Mm -hmm. 
Well, it's very hard to say that any dog in a dog fight can be declared a winner. Um, all of them become incredibly injured and suffer horrendous pain. Those who are declared the winner on the day are often forced to take part in more dog fights. Don't forget as well, they will have been injured during the fight. They're probably bleeding. And I mean, Peter has seen dogs who have taken part in dog fights who are absolutely mangled. They're completely covered in blood. Uh, they're covered in urine and saliva from fighting each other. And you see some that have been rescued afterwards and they're covered in scar tissue because their life is simply fighting with other animals. Those dogs who lose the fight, they're probably near to death anyway. The owners often either put them out of their misery because one, they've probably been humiliated by their loss um, and they're not worth anything to them anymore. They can't fight again. So we have heard reports and seen animals that have been disposed of in the most horrendous ways. So you're talking they've been set on fire, they've been shot, and left to starve, are simply thrown out with the trash because they're not worth anything anymore. And it's incredibly sad. I don't, I don't see any of that in the streets myself. But, and then in terms of these dogs' recovery, if do, would the owner take them to a vet? Is is with the vet uh, then is his legal responsibility to contact someone like yourselves or the RSPCA or do they just treat them privately? I mean, how does that work? Well, if the dog is lucky enough to be taken to a vet, uh, then if the vet suspected that it was involved in some kind of dog fighting ring, I would hope that he would contact the police and the RSPCA. Unfortunately, a lot of the times these dogs are not taken to the vet. That costs money. And as we know, dog fighting is about money. A lot of it is profit driven. Um, you could say it's about entertainment, but a lot of them do make some money on this and the illegal gambling involved as well. Taking these dogs that are probably not worth anything anymore, they're not going to be able to get a fight out of them to the vet is an extra expense. It's much easier for them to leave them out on the streets to die and for animal rehoming charities to pick them up sadly. And how prevalent is, I know you mentioned in the UK, is dog fighting worldwide? Yeah, well, it's actually obviously illegal in the UK. Mm. It does still take place in countries around the world, such as parts of Russia and Japan. And although it is legal in the UK and other countries um, like Canada and Italy, for example, it still does take place. So. The US has a big problem with dog fighting. It's a felony offence in all 50 states, but the underground dog fighting rings and the illegal gambling that goes along with it is a huge problem. And if you look at any animal shelter, the amount of pit bull terriers and staffordshires that are in there, it is clear to see the extent of this problem. Mm, so they're being terribly exploited. Yeah. Um, thank you for that. We might turn to something a bit, a bit more different now. If that's okay, we're going to go to um, animals in space. Yeah. I don't know, is that your topic? Yeah. Yeah, okay then. So, does this still happen in the world? I think we all know that famous dog, that was, was it the first dog, I can't yeah, remember his name. Micah. Yeah. Um, in, I think it was 1957, uh, 3rd of November, the Russians fired Laika into space. Um, sadly, they had no way of bringing the animal back, nor did they intend to, and Laika was burnt alive. Um, many animals have suffered similar fates in space flights since the beginning of space history. The first animal to be sent to space was in 1947. It was actually a bunch of fruit flies uh, launched in a V2 rocket by the US in the nose cone. Um, and uh, sadly, a number of animals die um, by this. The US and Europe have largely stopped space flights uh, for animals. We were all quite disgusted, I think, last year when Iran or photos came back from uh, the Iranian space agency uh, of a monkey, monkey. restrained. Um, apparently, the monkey was sent up to space. Um, it had never been bar verified or confirmed. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it harks back to the sort of the darkest days of the space race when uh, around two thirds of monkeys that were launched by NASA. Um, ended up dying on re-entry or just because their parachutes didn't open or uh, just because there was no way to safely bring them back. Um, so, yeah, unfortunately it does go on, but the European Space Agency has distanced itself now from doing so, saying that primate flights uh, have no um, scientific basis for us anymore. 
and in 2010 when NASA announced that they intended to uh, start sending primates back into space as part of a, a mission to Mars to see how monkeys would, um, would deal with uh, radiation at high altitudes uh, over an extended period of time because it would take up to three or four years to get to Mars. Um, PETA uh, and other animal protection organizations were successful in lobbying NASA to stop such missions because it was not only unethical but also bad science. Yeah, and um, what, what type of other animals are we talking here that would be sent up or that have been in the past? Yeah, well, the, the first animal uh, to enter space uh, was called Albert II, um, a rhesus monkey, uh, in 1949. And sadly, uh, Albert II was incredibly predictable, um, died on re-entry after the parachute failed. Um, over the years, we've seen mice, uh, newts, dogs, uh, monkeys, frogs, amphibians, um, you name it, everyone. They, they, animals, unfortunately, are at the, the sharp end of uh, human space flights. And long before the first humans, uh, Yuri Gagarin um, was in, in space and orbiting. Uh, animals were at the receiving end for decades before. What's the reason for sending the animals to space? Well, um, uh, space survivability, namely, um, is the stated purpose. Um, and more recently, uh, experiments have been conducted to see the biological processes. Um, more intelligent uh, experiments have gone out uh, to see how animals react under microgravity um, and see if they can perform simple tasks under despite their space conditions. Um, but really, you know, what we've learned from that is very little because animals and humans react in very different ways. Um, and indeed, if the animals had never been sent into space, humans would have gone eventually. Um, so it's just resulted, unfortunately, in mm. hundreds, if not thousands of dead animals. And how are the animals treated before and after they go? Do they receive any special treatment or tests? Or um, Well, they're, they're usually restrained, um, because you can't have uh, dogs and monkeys floating about, pressing things on the, on the space shuttle. Um, so they're usually restrained, and that's where we see such horrible photos come back of uh, monkeys being tied down, having their faces jammed between two boards, similar for life of the dog. Um, they often have electrodes implanted into their brain so they can bring back sensitive data information. Um, and unfortunately, uh, as I say, yeah, the often re-entry, certainly in the early days of spaceflight, it was a, a least concern um, once the animals are, uh, well, if they are recovered, um, they are often disposed of as it would seem too cruel to, to use them in multiple experiments, certainly. They're visibly terrified uh, when the, from the violence and the sound of launch and, and then space flight. Uh, so performing multiple experiments on them as in the UK under medical testing is, it would be um, a really bad idea. And gra how are they affected by gravity? Well, I know you said they're tied down, but if they were to... Yeah, um, well, they have, they have uh, done gravity experiments and some animals, when they do return, some animals who have been born in space, because that's happened as well, uh, haven't known up from down when they've come back to the UK, uh, to, to Earth. Um, so gravity, you know, like it affects us, and you've, we've all seen the, the footage that comes back from the space station of people flipping themselves around, looking yeah. happy, you know. It's understandably terrified. An animal is very confused when that happens to them. They, they have no idea what's going on. And... Uh, that you can see the panic on their face. Animals like us, they, they, they feel fear and, and pain, uh, just as we do. They are visibly distressed when, uh, when they're launched into space, and they have absolutely no concept of what's going on. But humans, astronauts who are trained, obviously do. Um, are there any alternatives to using animals if they want to, if they don't want to send humans or, you know, to explore new parts? Of you? What's the alternative? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, you can use... Uh, skin and cell cultures to see how human uh, organs will form in space, certainly on, in the Mars mission, um, to see how that kind of prolonged radiation uh, will affect humans. Um, skin and cell t uh, tests called uh, in vitro have been used a number of times. Um, we also, you know, modern simulators that bleed and breathe in, in exactly the same way that humans do um, are far more preferential to, to using animals who at the end of the day, have a different biology, a different autonomy, um, and tell us actually very little about how humans will behave.
Okay. And what efforts are being made to steer these animals in space? I know you said it was illegal. That what you convinced was it America and yeah, other so, countries? Yeah, so too? NASA in the early 90s, they stopped uh, sending primates into space. Um, and since uh, when, when we first discovered that they planned to uh, do these uh, primate experiments uh, for the Mars mission, you know, we, we voiced a number of concerns, namely that the experiments uh, were just going to blast gamma rays at the monkeys um, in short doses. Um, and, but actually, what is required would be a, a, to know how that kind of level of, of radiation affects them over the course of the three or four year mission to Mars. Um, also, you know, it's, uh, as I say, there are plenty of alternatives now. And we've, we've unfortunately got lots of um, data on how humans react under uh, intense radiation poisoning from uh, nuclear fallouts and things like that. So uh, the, the European Space Agency came out a few years ago and said that primate experiments have, have little interest to them. And they are very active in the space market now, representing a number of European countries. Um, and, you know, it's uh, no use for them than, than Iran and other countries currently embarking on, on primate exploration should, uh, should be the thing. And what's the longest case that you've heard of that an, an animal has spent time in space and, and maybe even returned to Earth? Tortoise. Okay. Um, I think for around, for years, anyway. around 70 days. Um, but, you know, uh, what, what does that actually teach us that a tortoise can survive in space? Mm. You know, that tells us nothing about how humans can behave. Um, and you know, in reality, there's only one way where we're going to get to Mars, and that's you know, if, a, if a human gets there first. The other thing we pointed out to, to NASA was that whilst these experiments were planned on monkeys, they haven't even designed the aircraft yet that can take us to Mars. They haven't designed the, the, the proper heat shields. So all of those experiments would be redundant, which is why uh, they did see the, the light at the end of the day and, and decided against those ill-formed Ill, Ill and unscientific experiments. Okay, thank you. That was very interesting. Um, our third and final topic today is animal testing. I don't know, is, is that both of you? Are you both kind of experts? That's, Are you again? Yeah. <laughs> it's okay, sort, of, sort of linked in with the vivisection with the animals in space. It, it's an extension of, of experimentation. Okay. Well, can you tell me a bit more about it? I know everyone knows that you, know, that you saw and see on products like makeup and clothes. Yeah. And well, we haven't actually... Um, been conducting experiments on animals for uh, cosmetics for over a decade now. Mm. And just last year, in fact, there was a, a marketing sales ban on animal-tested cosmetics. Cosmetics that have been tested on animals elsewhere. Uh, so it hasn't been allowed in Europe now, but now you can't even sell good, uh, the cosmetics that have been tested on animals, and that's, there, and that's a brilliant thing. But uh, sadly, it does go on for other reasons, for biosciences funding, for medical experiments. In the UK, we experiment on over 4.1 million animals every year, um, which is the highest number in a generation. Um, it's still perfectly legal to give electric shocks to rats, to uh, genetically engineer a mouse to get cancer, to force feed a dog pesticides, and to brain damage a monkey. Uh, in fact, all those abuses are absolutely routine, not just legal, but uh, go on all the time. So, um, yeah, I, you know, we could learn so much more if we experimented on humans, but of course we, we rightly see that any harmful testing on humans is unethical. But animals, as I say, they have the same ability to feel fear and pain and distress just as we do. Um, so any knowledge gained from experiments on animals cannot be justified. No, one would argue that they can't stand up for themselves, whereas I, I can, another would argue that rats, you know, maybe they are vermin and you know, in comparison to a monkey how, how how can people get away with testing on a monkey that in comparison to a rat that would be my yeah, well, in, in the UK we've, we've banned testing on great apes on our closest relatives uh, orangutans and chimpanzees and uh, gorillas not that a great deal of testing went on on gorillas but yeah, the, by far the largest uh, member of the animal kingdom is tested on are rodents uh, mice and, and rats um, but not only is it is it unethical from a, from a moral point of view to, to conduct these horrible experiments, but also uh, our anatomies differ so vastly to, to rodents. Uh, so, for example, uh, aspirin um, can kill uh, certain animals, whereas to us it's, you know, it's a great drug. Uh, penicillin kills guinea pigs, for example. What gives uh, rats cancer only gives mice cancer 46% of the time. Um, and so, you know, our 
really the only way to study what happens in humans is to study humans. It was um, Dr. Elias Sahuni, the former U.S. National Institutes of Health director last year, said that uh, we need to move back to testing human diseases on humans. We we cured uh, we cured AIDS in, in primates with about 90 different drugs, but of course we don't have a, a cure yet for, for humans. Um, so you know it's about time that we refocus. We're very good at curing diseases in animals now. What we're less good at is curing diseases in humans. We need to refocus on humans, and, and hopefully, actually, this last weekend we had a, a really interesting breakthrough. Um, we've now got organs on chips, uh, and you can now see what happens through toxicology testing um, for humans much more reliably via these in silico models, these computer uh, models that tell you much more reliably, much more cheaply, uh, and much more efficiently what could happen in humans. Because Human trials do take place, though, still, don't they? They if, do. If, if yeah. you, I mean, do you have to sign your life away if you want to. Well, they, they do. Uh, that's called clinical testing. That's animal testing is called preclinical testing. Um, but unfortunately, animal testing not only delays medical progress in many ways, but could also uh, seriously um, give give counterintuitive uh, results to what could happen on a human. So, you know, sometimes, unfortunately, it has been quite dangerous. The effects where it said uh, a drug would be efficient on on an animal um, is less so on a on a human. In fact, ninety percent of drugs that pass animal tests are either ineffective or, or dangerous in humans. And uh, before animals, and I say it's pre-clinical for animals, is, are they testing on embryos or cells or anything before the animals, or is it just straight testing to animals? Yeah, they, they do all that as well. Oh, yeah, um, okay. But uh, unfortunately, juries are swayed by large reams of, of animal testing data. Uh, and um, all, all too often, it's actually a legal requirement in the UK to, to test on animals. So all drugs, for example, have been tested on animals. Hopefully, one day soon, um, with you know, greater investment in the UK, we'll move away from that. But unfortunately, out of the £300 million pounds of uh, biosciences funding in the UK, uh, less than 1% of that actually goes into finding alternatives for animals. Um, so replacing, refining, reducing the amount of animal experiments is due to a lack of political and governmental will at the moment. We're, we've not seen so much of that, but hopefully... The cosmetics ban that I mentioned at the very top of this, that has produced uh, quite a lot of, uh, of interest, certainly, in finding alternatives because you know, we all want to find the best medicines. We all want uh, safe drugs and, and care for, for our relatives. Um, and the best way to do that is to you know, get serious about investment in alternatives to animals because at the end of the day, it's a pretty archaic system to still be experimenting on animals. So apart, apart from humans and animals, what, there is no other real alternative though, that we will know? Well, we, we've, we've got uh, very interesting simulators, cadavers, you know, we're able to use uh, old, old bodies, um, cell membranes, human, uh, scientists have also created a micro brain. But the most fascinating thing at the moment, as I say, these computer models, the organs on a chip, and now you can line up several organs to study what happens in a, in a whole human body. Um, and yeah, the, uh, the latest research really points to a dramatic decrease in the numbers of animals used in experiments over the next five years. Okay, and without, without naming any labs today, are, are there any labs you've approached who have, um, who, who you're working with who have changed, you know, have stopped using animals um, from your petitioning or from your lobbying? Or? Um, well, sadly it's all very secretive at the moment. There's a, a clause called uh, Section 29. Um, the, of uh, the Animals and Scientific Procedures Act, and actually, um, what, our knowledge about what goes on in human in labs is uh, is not, not very good because there's this veil of secrecy that takes place over animal experiments. Um, but hopefully, that will be repealed uh, in the not so distant future. So, you, you, have you tried to gain access to these labs in the past? Uh, it's all very secretive. There was an undercover investigation performed by the the BUAP, the British Union for the Abolition of Villa Section, last year at Imperial uh, University. Um, and as I said, they're not here to defend themselves, so I won't go into details, but BUAV, you can go onto their website and see the findings from their investigation. Um, and you know, it shouldn't really be up to animal charities to expose this. It should be much more tighter regulation. But in the UK, we only have 20 regulators, 20 inspectors, for over 4.1 million um, animal experiments. Uh, which really, you know, 
warrants a lot more consideration. That was my next question. You said 4.1 million animals earlier. Has that gone down in comparison no, to the past? No, that, that it's is still, the highest increasing. number in a generation. And it's as a result of... Uh, what's, a ge what's a generation? Yeah. Um, well, over the last 30 years or okay. so. So um, the number of genetically modified animals, animals who have been engineered to have limb and skull deformities, to have uh, certain parts of their DNA which are more uh, prone to getting uh, Parkinson's or, or HIV. Um, and uh, this number's increased by about 500% in the last 10 years. So it's these kind of experiments, whereas the, the number of non-genetically modified animals has actually fallen. Um, but, you know, genetically modified animals have the same ability to feel pain and fear just as we do. And um, they want to live out their lives and not be locked inside a, a cage, um, fearful of, of the next experiment on them. Molly the sheep, was that a gene genetified modified animal? Dolly. Dolly, was it Dolly? <laughs> Sorry, it was something like that, Dolly. Um, she yeah. lived for a healthy life, I think, did she? Uh, yes, but, um, you know, that's... That's, that's one instance, and all of the animals, as I say, who are experimented on are killed after their use. It's not allowed to have repeat testing on animals um, because it's, it's considered too inhumane. Now, if it's too inhumane to have multiple testing, surely you look at the kind of procedures, the kind of procedures I named that go on on animals, you know, that's, that's inhumane as well. Um, we don't do it on humans anymore. We shouldn't do it on animals. And are there any countries where it's still legal in animals in the world? Much well, it, cos cosmetics testing, for example, is, is still legal in, in China, the experiment on animals. Um, and we're working quite closely, our, our US affiliates working quite closely with China to allow the first non-animal test of cosmetics into the country. Uh, India's been very successful at that recently as well, introducing legislation to do just the same. How hard is it to convert them? Um, well, we've done it in, in Europe, we've done it in the UK, uh, we've, done it, uh, we've had it now for over a decade. Um, so, you know, it just these things take time. Um, we've been doing archaic and cruel animal experiments for centuries. Um, so, as with all of these things, it, it just takes a bit of time and a bit of evidence. But now, fortunately, we do. We are starting to get the evidence. We're starting to get um, much more precise, accurate, and, uh, and cheaper, more efficient ways of, of uh, toxicology testing on a uh, number of non-animal scientists. So a company that would have maybe a base in America and a base in China, they could, couldn't in America, but there is a legal loophole that they could do it in China. Yeah, they could, and, and they're, un unfortunately they, they're required to at the moment by the Chinese government. Um, but uh, you know, Peter does work uh, with all of these companies to try and get, try and get them to see that uh, the, the customer demand is really, if you look at even beauty specialists and, and people in the cosmetics industry, Body, people like the Body Shop have been really successful promoting themselves on being um, kind to animals, uh, and you know, that is the future. And typically, what would happen to an animal after they finish experimenting with it? They have to be killed uh, as a result. Um, they, as I say, it's not, you're not allowed to, to do repeat testing on them, so they are all disposed of. And um, you know, unfortunately, often it's, it's a merciful relief. Um, but as uh, investigations have shown, they're, they're killed in, in not very nice ways. Um, you know, but I, I think it's, unfortunately, it's a, it's a light relief to, to what is a, a pretty nasty life of being bred, mm. being caged, and then being experimented on. Finally, again, what, what's the solution, and how long do you think before it can be, I know you said it was 10 years since clinical testing, but how long do you think there will be a turnaround again before we can, so we can convince people? Well. As I say, we are, it, it is science that is really exciting, it's really progressive, uh, it's happening very quickly. Um, in the UK, greater transparency and openness um, from medical experimenters is to be welcomed. Uh, and we are starting to see uh, the government put in a consultation about this at the moment for, to lift the veil of secrecy. And uh, we're starting to see the, the fruits of that. But um, the most exciting thing is, is the investment. If we can increase investment in uh, reducing and replacing animals in experiments, then you know, we can see a, a huge paradigm shift in the not too distant future. OK, thank you. It's been great. I just have a couple of uh, listener questions, if that's sure. OK with you. Um, someone sent in, do you condone violence as a means of protesting? Uh, no, Peter, generic. Peter is a, a, as I say, we're a registered charity in the UK. Uh, we'd simply lose our charitable status if, if we did anything like that. Um, 
all movements uh, have had their um, their fringe elements, the underground railroad resistance, the French Revolution. Um, we are a peaceful, non-violent organization. We, we do understand when people are uh, driven to extremes to, to uh, free animals and, and break test tubes and the like, but you know, we would never condone any, any violence against you. Yeah. Okay, thanks. And a couple of questions here. There's a couple in my ear afterwards, but I have three here as well. Donald, Fre Donald Freeney has said, um, do you think it was right to use the discovery of a human leg in Dublin as a promotional opportunity for your organization? I'm not sure if you're aware of this. Yes, I am. Um, that was a, a billboard that Peter had wanted to put up in, in Dublin. Uh, the, the billboard um, compared, uh, well, it, had, it was a picture of a body part of a human leg on a dinner plate. Um, and the whole reason that we want to do something like this is to raise awareness of the fact that the best thing anyone could do for animals, whether it's animals in, in space, animals in labs, or, or bullfighting or dogfighting, whatever, is simply to leave them off their plates. Um, in the UK, we consume over a billion animals for food every year. Most of them are raised in horrific factory farms. Mm -hmm. They're deprived of all that comes naturally to them. They can never smell fresh air or feel the sun on their backs, for example, until the very day that they're sent off to slaughter. So by putting that billboard, we hope our, our message of non-violence gets out and that people stop eating animals. A, a sort of some question there. Are most people who work for Peter, would you say they're vegetarians or vegans or? I think they're mostly vegetarian or vegan. Mm -hmm. I think mostly vegan. In fact, um, you know, the dairy industry, the egg industry, still causes enormous cruelty to animals. Um, so we do encourage people to, to go to our website to get our free vegan starter kits. Um, it's the best thing they can do for their their own health, uh, for the good of the environment, and morally, it's the right thing to do. Okay, thank you. Another question from Christopher Caden. He said, um, what's the, your opinion on wasted meat and other animal parts? I think he means what's left behind, Sure. what happens. Sure. Um, well, you know, we are a vegan advocacy organization. We, uh, the best thing that anyone can do is to try delicious, healthy mock meats and uh, plant-based alternatives to eating meat. Um, but if you're going to be raising and killing animals for food, then uh, at the very least, you can dispose of the, the whole carcass, and you know. But really, there's no no need to eat meat anymore. We, at our local grocery stores, we can get delicious alternatives: tofu and tempura, and mm. the nuts and seeds and the greens that I eat, have been eating now for five years, and feel so good because of it. You know, anyone can do that, and uh, at the click of a button, we can get anything these days. So there's really no need to, to kill any animals. Leads on to the next question from Martin. He says that vegetarian and veganism as a solution to various health problems um, and animal rights, do you see this as an ownership of animals as immoral? I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah, well, as I say, Peter's uh, motto is animals are not ours to eat, wear, experiment on, or abuse in any way. Um, we're not really owners of animals, we're, we're guardians, we're companions. Um, and if you have the right aim for the animal, if the animal's best interest is at, is at heart, then, then great, then we can live side by side with animals in, and, and have a love and respect for them. But sadly, you know, all too often it's, it's, uh, it's human interest that's put before animals and that's where you have a problem with Peter. Okay, thank you. Uh, do I have any questions from upstairs? Yes, we've got... Dante is saying pet species need to be exterminated and only uh, wild species are left. Is that true? Pets uh, Peter doesn't support uh, killing uh, companion animals or pets um, just because, you know, well, as I say, we can live side by side with animals. M most companion animal guardians are very loving, uh, have the best interest of the animal at heart, and they can have great companionship with animals. Mm. Um, un unfortunately, as Kirsty said, we see far too many instances of cruelty to animals reported up and down the country. Um, and in those circumstances, often the best thing to do is to take the animal away and try and rehome them. Um, but what, unfortunately, euthanasia is a tragic necessity of people's uh, lack of love, lack of a good home uh, for these animals. And um, you know, initially, we want people to be to rehome their animals, but. Uh, yeah, unfortunately, there's a heartbreaking task of, of putting animals to sleep. Would you have an estimate of how many animals are put down every year? I think it's about 10,000 dogs and similar number for cats in the UK. Mm. Um, you know, the best thing that anyone can do for those companion animals is to have them sterilised, as Kirsten says, to have their companion animals spayed and neutered. 
um, to prevent thousands more um, unwanted and unloved animals coming into the world. Yeah, Any, anyone else? Yeah, everything. Flesher says, Peter, have so much power and respect, but is there a counter movement against you? Um, you know, I think most of the people are on our side. I hope so. We're, as you can see, we're pretty reasonable people. We've got rational, fully formed ideas. Um, there are large uh, vested interests of animal abusers out there, powerful, wealthy organizations backed by restaurant chains. They're kind of people who bring healthy animals into this world just to kill them, who I think would like to see uh, a world without pizza. But we're not going anywhere. Um, you know, Fortunately, we have a great deal of support. We enjoy a great deal of support in the UK. And um, you know, people love animals. And if people continue to love animals and you know, continue to respect animals regardless of their love, uh, we'll be here to, to be a voice for them. Yep. And what do you think we can do to stop worldwide poaching of gorillas? Um, well, the best thing that we can do is invest in habitat protection. Um, you know, I think spending millions of pounds on new enclosures in zoos is wrong when you consider what that money would buy in the wild um, for you know, anti-poaching um, staff members and fences. And, we need people to become educated about habitat protection. Um, and if zoos were serious about conservation efforts, they would encourage people to, to conserve in these animals' natural environments mm. instead of spending lots of money on merchandise and uh, ice cream sales. OK. Anyone else? <laughs> Another one. Is that all right with you? Good. Yeah? Two more. OK. Jamo asks, what's the deal with those, what is it, sorry? Peter Pokemon parodies. Never heard of this. Yeah, I mean, that was something in the US. I'm afraid I'm not, uh, and I don't think Kirsty is particularly okay with this. I think it was a PTUS computer game, or a parody of a computer game that was created by PTUS. Um, something to do with animal cruelty. They used this popular computer game, people could play it, play along. And what, and kill animals? No, no, it was, oh. I think it was about captivity of animals, or at least. Um, helping animals as best you can. It wasn't, we didn't do it in the UK, unfortunately, yeah. but it got a lot of uh, attention in the US, and of course, the younger people who are kind of into computer games and Pokemons, they were all over it, and yeah, loads of people. Is there something you could replicate here that you could bring in contemporary yeah. culture? I know you said you're on social media and stuff, but yeah. is there some sort of game that you could tap into or something? Yeah, I mean, we, we, we are always looking for new ways to bring the animal rights debate into the mainstream. You know, that's why our our campaigns use humor and use sex and use really innovative ways of, of getting people to talk about animals because we know that the, the the quickest way to make achievements for animals is to get people talking and that's why our, our campaigns are often controversial and shocking um, and yeah I mean we'd, if there was an appetite for it in this country we'd, we'd definitely be about it because you know, we we'd do anything to, to help drive the the conversations about animals since the mainstream. And do you have audience ideas? Do people come to you and say, um, would, you, would you execute their ideas? Or have you done it yeah, in the past? Yeah, we, we, we have a, a very active membership um, who are always willing to, to lend a hand and come up with ideas. Uh, we have brainstorming sessions in, in our offices as well. Um, we have a lot of creative people on. And I think that's why you know, PETA is the kind of organization that is people do have heard of us, whether they know how to pronounce PETA correctly or not. They, they know who PETA are and what they stand for. Um, and you know, we have been amazingly successful ever since our um, I'd Rather Go Naked Than Wear Fur. Um, mm. Everyone remembers that campaign from the early 90s. You know, now 95% of British women wouldn't be caught dead in fur, according to a recent survey. So you know, we, do, uh, we have a, a very strong track record of achieving results, and that's, that's because of the creativity and because we're always coming up with ideas, and we, we welcome people to come up with ideas. Please do send them. Yeah, in. OK, then. And I think there's one more question. Final two, sorry. <laughs> Another one's coming. You've got an active audience as um, well. I know, yeah, <laughs> the audience. <laughs> Jim asks, how would animal rights improve his life? Ah, oh, interesting. I That's mean, a good one. Mm. Do you want to talk about it from a vegan point of view? Sure, I mean, even just for yourself, by going vegan, and um, that's not eating any animal products, you would enjoy such health benefits I know I did when I went vegan a few years ago. Even just from vegetarian to vegan, I felt so much better, so much healthier, had more, much more energy. So even taking the animals out of it, going vegan, stopping eating meat just for yourself, 
you will see so many benefits on a day-to-day -day basis. I think you would also feel more compassion in your life as well, because obviously you're not killing something just to put it on your plate when there are so many other options available. And yeah, I think if he wants to come along to one of my demonstrations, he's more than welcome to. Come along, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> and were you always a vegetarian yourself? or? I wasn't, no. I, no. I ate meat when I was younger, as most of us do. Uh, we're brought up to think that this is the usual thing to do, and yeah, that's what people do. What changed you? Um, well, I went vegetarian in high school, and then I, I switched back to eating meat, and then finally in college, I had my epiphany moment when I read an animal rights book by Professor Peter Singer. Uh, he talks about animals um, and basically asks why are we using them. I then started a debate in the class asking people, and I was fighting for animal rights, so I was saying, no, we should support animal rights, and then someone turned around to me and said, well, do you eat them? And I had to say yes. And I felt so stupid and such a hypocrite that I've never eaten meat since. And then it was a few years ago after watching a Peter video of a dairy farm that I went vegan because I no longer could support putting money into such an awful industry. Mm. Um, I know one of my friends who did give up eating meat so it was a vegetarian, then ate meat, and then went back. They, they felt very sick. They, they used to get sick after eating it. Is that a psychological thing, or is that because there are all these products in meat that make you sick? It, it, I don't know if there's research you've, you've read on that. Do you mean they used to get sick after this, eating meat? Yeah, but they, they gave up meat, and then they went back. And, mm -hmm. now, and then when they give up meat again, when they had, were eating meat, they mm -hmm. used to get sick yeah, afterwards. Yeah. I don't know, is that psychological? or I used to think it was. I mean, there, there is a kind of cleansing thing that comes with only eating plant-based foods. And there's a whole load of health information out there about how a vegetarian and vegan diet is, is better for your health. Uh, there was a study out last year from Oxford University, the largest study of its kind, that showed that vegetarians have a third less chance of, of getting heart disease. Um, again, similar proportions have been associated with some of Britain's worst killers, like uh, strokes and diabetes and cancer, certain forms of cancer. So I think the average vegetarian or vegan are generally in better health than the average meat eater. Okay. Thank you. Any, uh, one more question? Final question. <laughs> From the Condia, he says, what would be the idealistic solution to animal testing? I'm not sure if you covered that earlier. The idealistic solution. I mean, ultimately, animal experiments are an imperfect science. Um, not only are they morally incredibly questionable, um, but also you cannot uh, fully extrapolate the uh, results of animal experiments to humans. In an ideal world, we'd have much more efficient, cheaper, uh, more accurate human and computer in vitro models that would more reliably predict what would happen in humans. And we'd see an end to these archaic and outdated experiments on animals, which have surely run their course now. And frankly, they belong in the dark ages. OK. But thank you very much for your time today. Um, so again, thanks to Ben and Kirsty for joining us today. We have two live interviews for you tomorrow. The first is with Big Brother Watch, and it's on the truth behind surveillance and how information is used. That's from 10 in the morning. That's British time. The second is with the artist taxi driver, Chunky Mark, Mark McGowan, on the truth about the war machines. And that will be at 4 p.m. British time. So I hope you can join us for those then. See you then.